Alrighty, let's go to Human Anatomy, Chapter 14, the Somatic Nervous System. So this is all your senses, right? Hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. So we're going to talk about hearing, sight, um, taste, all good stuff. Alright, so just kind of a quick review as far as the lobes of the cerebrum, what we've been talking about in chapters 12 and 13. Um, the frontal lobe, again, is for abstract thought, explicit memory, mood, motivation, foresight and planning, decision making, emotional control, social judgment, speech production. So there's the frontal lobe right here. Here's the precentral gyrus. There's a central uh, sulcus and a postcentral gyrus. This is sensory. This is motor. Okay. Parietal lobe can do taste, somatic sensation, sensory integration, visual processing, spatial perception, language processing, numeric awareness. The occipital lobe is visual awareness, visual processing. The temporal lobe, hearing, smell, emotion, learning, language comprehension, memory consolidation, verbal memory, visual and auditory memory, language. The insula is taste, pain, visceral sensation, consciousness, emotion, and empathy and cardiovascular homeostasis. Now, we have to talk about uh, receptors that we have in our body, which is, um, let's say something's too hot to touch, when high temperature is sensed in the skin, a reflexive withdrawal is initiated by the muscles of the arm. So sensory neurons, afferent, are stimulated by a st uh, stimulus, which is sent to the central nervous system, and then a motor response via efferent uh, nerves will be sent to the musculoskeletal muscles that control this movement. So the receptors are structures that detect some type of stimuli and classes of receptors are by the modality or the type of stimuli. So you have thermoreceptors, which do temperature. You have photoreceptors, which uh, sense light. Chemoreceptors that sense chemicals. Nociceptors that uh, sense pain. And the mechanoreceptors that sense pressure or stretch. Now, the classes by distribution of receptors in the body, general sensors are widely distributed uh, body senses, and special senses involved, the cranial nerves, are very complex. So you have uh, exteroreceptors, which are from the outside of the body. Then you have interoceptors, which are from organs within the body. But then you also have proprioceptors, which are regarding the position of the body in space. Okay, so when we're doing some kind of musculoskeletal rehab, Let's say for the ankle, we'll work on proprioception, so to prevent further injuries. Now, the general sense is, again, there's unencapsulated nerve endings, uh, which are dendrites that lack some kind of connective wrapping. They're usually free nerve endings, uh, which are warm receptors, cold receptors, nociceptors. So if I ask on the quiz, nociceptors are what type of uh, uh, nerves? And you can say they're free nerve endings. We have tactile discs, which sense light, touch, and pressure. So if I ask on the quiz, what type of sensation is measured by light, touch, and pressure? You would say tactile disc. And then we have the hair root plexus, which uh, senses if there's insects crawling on your skin with a little movement of the hairs. Okay, and those are peritracheal endings. The encapsulated nerve endings, uh, dendrites wrapped by glia or connective tissue. And we have tactile corpuscles. Uh, that's an oval mass in the germinal papillae. They sense light touch, texture, perception. You have end bulbs, similar to tactile corpuscle, but located in the mucous membranes. You have bulbous corpuscles, which are flat. They sense pressure, skin, stretch, and joint movement. You have lamellar corpuscles, which are kind of onion-like. They sense deep pressure, stretch, tickling. Uh, muscle spindles are fusiform. Uh, they sense stretch, and then tendon organs, which are leaf-like, that sense tendon stretch caused by muscle activity. Now, you have encapsulated nerve endings, uh, free nerve endings, widespread, especially in the epithelia, pain, heat, cold. You have tactile discs that sense light, touch, and pressure. You have hair receptors that sense light, touch, movement of the hairs. Okay, the Encapsulated nerve endings, um, tactile corpuscles, they tension sense light touch, texture, end bulbs, uh, similar to tactile corpuscles, bulbous corpuscles, uh, they're found in the dermis, uh, heavy continuous touch or pressures, joint 
movements, lamellar corpuscles, uh, they sense deep pressure, stretch, tickle, vibration, uh, muscle spindles uh, that sense uh, tension in the muscles, proprioception, uh, tendon organs that are found um, in the tension in the tendons as well. So you have all these receptors, there's a great little uh, chart that will help you figure all this stuff out. So probably a good thing to focus on the lamellar corpuscles that do deep pressure, uh, the tactile corpuscles, on the free nerve endings. All right, so here's what they look like. Uh, uh, free nerve endings, tactile disc, hair receptor, tactile corpuscles. I probably won't ask you what they look like, but it's always go good to go back to the, the table and see what their modality, what they do is the best thing. All right, so the receptive field, uh, you probably know this. If you try to feel sensation on your fingertips, you could probably delineate between uh, two uh, sharp objects. But if I were to do the same thing on your back, you're probably like, mm, it just feels like one. So the receptive field is an area uh, 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 supplied by a single neuron. So neurons in different regions of the body have receptive fields of different sizes. But neurons with small receptive fields, for example, the skin of the fingers, allow for fine two-point discrimination. And if you remember from the, the distribution of sensation in your brain, remember we have a whole huge area dedicated to the hand but not so much the back, so that makes sense. Now pain uh, um, is discomfort that makes us aware of injurious situations. So it's kind of a warning sign. The body uses pain to alert us that, hey, that something could be wrong. So there's a lot of things that we want to pay attention to when it comes to pain. Well, there's different nociceptors responsible for fast versus slow pain. Pain from the head is conducted by the cranial nerves to the brain. Pain from below the head travels by the spinal thalamic and spinal reticular tracts. So those are probably two tracts that I'd probably uh, quiz you on. Uh, um, so make sure you know those tracts. So somebody that cannot feel pain, they might have some damage to the spinal thalamic or the spinal reticular tracts. So let's say you touch a sharp tack and you get these nociceptors uh, that we know are responsible for pain. This is the first order. Then it's going to go through the spinal cord and then it's going to go up through the thalamus and then it's going to go to your somatosensory association. You can also go through the spinal reticular tract and the reticular formation and then it will make its way to the primary somatosensory cortex. So you have two different tracts that do uh, pain sensation. Okay. Now you can also get referred pain. So pain from the viscera mistakenly thought to come from more superficial thigh sites. So let's say you have a heart attack. Um, now since there's some common neurons that are shared by the heart and the shoulder and the thoracic, you might get the sensation that it goes from the left arm traveling down and even to the jaw. So that's a very typical situation where it's, um, mostly males as well because um, women for some reason don't experience the same sort of sensation due to their wiring um, where a lot of women will think it's just indigestion or gas and then come into the ER and they might have uh, uh, MI that was uh, that had occurred so you want to be aware of that women especially you want to be aware of the situation if you have some kind of chest discomfort um, and it's, uh, intense like an elephant uh, sitting on your chest you should probably uh, get that checked out and don't think that's just gas and will go away because like I said men uh, have a typical pattern where it, uh, they can feel it in their left jaw, left arm, but women don't, not so much. If you look at this, um, kidneys can refer pain down to here, the ureter, the appendix can refer here, the liver and gallbladder. Another common site the gallbladder tends to refer is the right scapula. Uh, stomach can refer into the back and the heart is right in here. So uh, being aware that, hey, uh, different visceral organs can refer to different parts of the body and we want to make sure that is it a musculoskeletal thing we don't always think it's muscle we want to make sure it fits uh, like the example i gave you that my patient had uh, pain in her right scapular every time she ate nachos uh, or um a pizza well that doesn't make sense muscles don't uh, increase in pain just because from eating but the gallbladder does because the gallbladder is responsible for breaking down fat so you got to make sure it makes sense now taste buds oh we love to eat right so we go from pain to taste, gustation. Um, the tongue has the most taste buds. 
uh, some of the soft palate, the pharynx, the epiglottis, and cheeks. So we do have some taste buds back there. Uh, we taste through what we call the lingual papillae. Those are little surface projections on the tongue. Uh, there's a few different kinds. There's the filiform, which are very numerous, tiny spikes. They have no buds, though. There's folate, ridges on the tongue, sides, uh, buds in children. The fungiform, mushroom-shaped bumps, have buds. The valate, large bumps in a row at the back of the tongue, have buds. So when you uh, uh, look back in the modules, I have some links to some good uh, uh, YouTube videos. I can't put them in here uh, because they're all copyrighted, but... Uh, I do have the links to those videos that you can watch and how do we taste, how do we smell, um, interesting stuff. Um, tastes like chicken. Guess what? If saliva cannot dissolve something, you can't taste it. So in order for foods or anything else to have a taste, chemicals from substance must be dissolved by the saliva. So if you don't believe it, try drying off your tongue before tasting something. So saliva needs to break down all that amylase. Okay, lipase is broken down by the gallbladder, but... The saliva breaks down certain things. Now, next time, um, try eating a pizza upside down and see if those different flavors hit the tongue uh, a little bit faster. Um, it's very interesting. Um, again, taste buds contain taste cells, which are a little banana shape. They have these little taste hairs, a receptor for taste modulation, uh, synapses with sensory nerves, and you have these little taste pores. So different epithelium are responsible for different tastes. Sometimes... Uh, people get the misnomer that, hey, we have a certain area that does, that does bitter, salty, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's yes and no. Uh, most most of the tongue can uh, do the five flavors, salty, sweet, uh, 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 savory. But the back of the tongue has more proportion of bitter. And that's more like a protective mechanism. So if we had uh, uh, tasted something kind of, kind of like poison or it's that bad for you, uh, as a last resort, the body will spit that out. So there's a a handful of bitter uh, sensors uh, um, in the back of the tongue, but really they, we have bitter on the tip of the tongue and the side as well, just like the other sensations. So if you look at this little taste bud, you got these supporting cells. You've got uh, this uh, taste pore, taste hairs, tongue, epithelium. Okay. All right. So that's taste. And again, we'll make sure you watch the YouTube video on how we taste. So there's the five basic uh, taste sensations. You have sweet, which is sugar, saccharin, alcohol, some amino acids, some lead salts. Sour, hydrogen ions in solution. Salty, metal ions, inorganic salts, sodium chloride, taste saltiest. Uh, bitter, alkaloids such as quinine, uh, gin and tonic, right? Nicotine, caffeine, um, coffee is essentially bitter. Uh, non alkaloids such as aspirin, if you ever bite into an aspirin, those are bitter. And again, you have more bitter sense, sensor taste buds in the back of your tongue. And then umami, also known as savory, uh, uh, amino acids, glutamate and aspartate. That's kind of like that beefy, cheesy, barbecue-y, savory, uh, MSG taste. All right. All right. Now we go from smell. Now remember, taste and smell go hand in hand because if you can't smell, 40% of taste is smell. Uh, um, so you have these olfactory mucosa, roof of the nasal cavity, you contain about 10 to 20 million olfactory neurons. Olfactory neurons have olfactory hair, cilia with binding sites for odor molecules. Olfactory cells, axons, make olfactory nerve, okay? And the olfactory bowls, which are the swollen tips of olfactory tracts at the base of the frontal lobes. So sensation of smell is very interesting because it's tied to emotion, tied to our amygdala. So smell can bring back a lot of certain good memories, bad memories. So if we look at your nose, can remember 50,000 different scents. While a bloodhound's nose may be a million times more sensitive than a human's, that doesn't mean that the human uh, uh, sense of smell is useless. Humans can identify a wide variety of scents, and many are strongly tied to memories. So women are born better smellers than men and remain better smellers over life. Studies have shown that women are more able to quickly pinpoint just what a smell is. Women are better able to identify citrus, vanilla, cinnamon, and coffee smells. Well, women are overall better smellers. Guess what? There's an unfortunate 2% of the population with no sense of smell at all. That means their food is always bland as well because they can't taste 40%. Uh, do opposites attract? Yes. Everyone has a very unique smell except for identical twins. Uh, newborns are able to recognize the smell of their mothers, and many of us can pinpoint the smell of our significant others and those we're close to. 
Part of that smell is determined by genetics, but it's also largely due to the environment, the diet that they eat, personal hygiene products, and that create a unique chemistry for each person. And that's true. It's like, let's say you have a, 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 um, a, your best friend that has a nice cologne or a perfume, and that they smells really good on them. And then you're like, oh, man, I got to buy that. And then you go buy it. And guess what? It smells terrible on you. You can just waste 150 bucks. Well, because, you know, your genetics mixed with your diet and personal hygiene, sometimes it doesn't uh, create the same kind of uh, uh, scent. So if you're going to buy a perfume or cologne for your significant other, make sure it smells good on them and not on somebody else. Otherwise, they might not use it. And you're like, oh, man, I just wasted some money. Uh, again, the olfactory projections, uh, signals do not pass the thalamus. Uh, okay, so the sense of smell or protective smell developed before the thalamus, uh, uh, stimulating primary oil. So that's a protective mechanism. That's why sense of smell is tied to memory and tied to the brain so much because it bypasses the thalamus. Second areas include insula, orbital frontal, the hippocampus, and the amygdala, which are tied to short and long-term memories, the hypothalamus. So that's why it evokes strong memories, emotions, and visceral reactions. All right.